Welcome to the Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello, it is great to be with you. Today we're going to be talking about how the contemplative life informs our parenting. And we just want to acknowledge, first of all, that not everyone has children that's listening to this podcast, or maybe you don't have children at home anymore. But I think that the ideas that we're talking about are applicable to maybe work or other relationships in your life. Uh, because the thing is, is that, you know, children have their own agency, and so does everybody else <laughs> that we are interacting with in our lives. And I think sometimes as parents, it's easy to mix up what we think our parenting should look like, our roles with our children, and how that intersects with our own individual agency as human beings. I also want to acknowledge that the three of us are very much in the thick of parenting right now. Uh, we, The combined of our households include um, adoptive children, biological children, spanning from preschool through middle school. So. We're not coming here as experts saying we have it all together, but just as we are navigating our own parenting, what we're learning and how the contemplative informs that. So let's talk about that today. Yeah, I think for myself, when I think about contemplative and how it's been helpful for me as a parent is I tend to be a person who is shame-based uh, and, I'm, and I'm saying that that's it's it's not good. It's not bad. That's just that's just my journey. That's what that's what's happened, and um, I think the contemplative ha has helped me to to pay attention to to way shame manifests itself in my life, and uh, I've been diligent to to um, you know read books and listen to podcasts to help myself. Uh, become a person that is sort of pushing shame out of his life. But I think it shows up a lot in my parenting. And I think it's one of the, the ways that I, as a contemplative, I want to pay attention. So as much as I would, you, you know, you would think that if you're a, a person who has shame in their life, that you wouldn't then shame other people, but that isn't how it works. You know, if, if you've, um, if you've picked up on shame, uh, you then transmit shame to others. Uh, it's, it's probably learned behavior. And so I, uh, I would never purposely want to shame my children, but, you know, I think being a, being a person who pays attention, uh, who, who, who contemplates his actions, the words that he says, you know, even down to, it was a few days ago, you know, I was talking to my son and I, I was saying, do you want to be the only one at school that doesn't wear a backpack? And it's like, oh, wait, that's a, that's a shaming technique, you know. And so I think for me personally, um, it's it's changed how I communicate. It's changed how I interact with them on different topics. I, I no longer try to get them to do what I want them to do. Mostly. <laughs> I still fall into that trap sometimes. But I become aware of. Like you said, Christina, we all have our own agency and it, you know, what is the goal of parenting? Uh, what is my goal? And so I, my goal is like to pay attention to myself and what comes up inside of me as I, as I relate. And like you said earlier, it, it's not just our children that, that causes these things to surface in our lives. Uh, it could be a coworker that, you know, that you think of as a child <laughs> who, who causes these, these things to surface in your life. So that's what I think of when I think of how has the contemplative life helped me. Yeah. I think that notion of paying attention is so, like, when you say paying attention, I just glom right onto it. Uh, because in my world, I feel like I am, I am naturally driven. And I kind of enjoy that about myself like the when things get really busy my energy level goes right up I'm like all right we're gonna conquer this and do it it's gonna be great uh, but my kids don't they don't need all that they don't want all that and, uh, I was naturally very performance oriented as a child so um, 
thankfully, I at least read their faces a little bit, right? So <laughs> I found that if they asked me like to look at their paper or to hear a song that they just wrote or to look at this outfit that they put together, if I wasn't giving them a response that like really blessed their inner self, right? <laughs> uh, that the face would fall and I would think, shoot, right? I missed it. I messed it all up. Maybe because I was, you know, preoccupied or because I would have done it differently. There's a billion reasons for why. And so I think, and I think back to my own childhood, like I once remember asking my dad how I looked and he said, well, you look like a girl. And I was so deflated about that. Like I, I wanted something more effervescent. And so I have found that this notion of paying attention and it's not easy because they will come at you and come at you, and come at you. So a few years ago, I ran into a guided meditation and like the loving kindness meditation is out there in so many forms. So I feel like you could encounter it differently in different places. But this one really asks you to see the person's face in your mind. And it really helped me because doing homework with my kids brings up all of my drivenness, right? All the ways in which I want to succeed. And I would want you to succeed for your benefit, of course. Um, so to see their faces in my mind and then speak like, may you be blessed, may you be happy, may you have peace, may you be safe, may you be healthy, whatever it is. Uh, that was really touching. It helped me remember, I don't just want them to succeed. I love them, I care about them, but I can easily lose touch. Like success is very important to me. <laughs> so yes, this paying attention is very helpful. Yeah. And Chris, I appreciate what you're saying too, about sort of your goal in parenting or what successful parenting looks like is noticing what's going on in yourself. And I think that has been a, a shift in my life as well of it's not about how my kids turn out or if they're behaving a certain way or whatever it is, but how am I showing up as a parent and responding? And Interestingly, I think that has really taken root lately in my prayer life in different ways. I'm noticing when my kids were much younger, I I don't know, I had these different prayer books about 30 ways to play with your, pray with your kids or for your kids. And so I had these different topics of, you know, wanting to pray blessings over this and that and very sort of scripted in my prayer and making sure that I'm investing prayer energy and positive things into their lives. Where now it's like, you know what, that is not the type of prayer parenting that I is that a word, parenting prayer, <laughs> that I want to um, offer? But it's more so as something's coming up with my kids, first I have to go with, okay, God, what emotion is rising up in me? My child's doing something that is a disappointment to me, or I'm, I'm concerned about what they're doing, or I'm worried about it. And so first having to deal with my own emotion and naming that, and then I feel like I'm in a much different place to then interact with whatever it might be to hold space for them and and to listen to God on their behalf and to be with them or to respond lovingly. You know, Christina, your loving kindness. I love that having the picture of your child in mind. And so I think for me, that's been a huge shift of instead of like, I'm praying to you or for you. It's like, no, first I'm, I'm noticing myself inviting God into my own perceptions and then letting it flow from there. Yeah. I think, you know, to what you said, Christina, about praying for your kids and, and how that, how that, that changes. Well, I don't, I don't think it's just changed prayer for my, for my kids. But oftentimes I like, I find I don't really know what to pray. You obviously I am a caring parent and a caring parent prays for their children, uh, engages with the divine on, on the behalf of, of, of his kids. And so one of the things that I've, that has changed just over the past couple of years is this, uh, this idea of apophatic prayer. And I won't go into a lot of it, but, uh, I've, since created prayer beads and prayer beads is, is I just, I sort of rotate through these beads and I pray for my children. I'm not saying any words. I am mindful of them. I am aware of them as I'm moving through prayer. I'm, I'm, I'm putting these beads through rotation. So I think that's how I've changed in, in my prayer life with my children. And I like that because I think it shifts from trying to fix our kids or manipulate or control, which I totally do. Like if my child's inconveniencing me, I can easily whip out the 
<laughs> you know, and they don't know that that's what it is. But if I'm being honest with myself, it's I'm trying to manipulate the situation because I'm inconvenienced and I want to do what I want to do. But I think what you're saying of just, you know, allowing that, you know, you're holding space for your kids or having that apathetic prayer, I think for me has definitely shifted me away from that fixing kind of parenting to more of just a delight, like, who are you? Who is in front of me right now? And what does it mean to be in this moment with my child? Yes, I'm reading the same story 13 times and I don't really want to read this story again, but you know what? This is the moment that's that's the invitation here and I can choose to engage or I can lovingly shift if that's the right choice as well. Uh, but But just coming from a different energy space, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. I feel like I don't know a ton about communal contemplative. I feel like I'm I'm just coming into this notion of how do you invite a community into the experience together, but with parenting, I need I need all the people because <laughs> I feel so worried all the time and then I feel shame in you know to Chris's point that I feel worried because I shouldn't feel worried or something like that. But um to have somebody else remind me of like time and how time affects things and that we can't really know and to have them join me then allows me to be able to dial back when I go into my own prayer experience so that I can say, God, these are yours, right? <laughs> and, and and sit and breathe and bless them and look for the good. But I like the notion too of like, I don't always need a word to pray for my kids. I can just sit. Who was it? Is it Ruth Haley Barton that talks about maybe just lighting the candle and like intercession is not always words. It is just like I am sitting and by way of thinking of you, you are in the room, which was such a powerful and relieving notion for me that I don't always have to have a word. So, Chris, I really appreciate what you're saying there. I think poetry has also been very helpful to me as well, you know, like just reading poetry uh, because it has a way of, of broadening and expanding my awareness of life in general. I sometimes become so myopic on my, my situation and my circumstance and my children and my relationships. And poetry just has a way of, of making everything broader uh, and opening up the universe for myself and, and just sort of saying, hey, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. And to that issue of time, a lot of times if we just let time play out, a lot of our issues in life will work themselves out, uh, particularly with our children. You know, I think a lot of times I get intense about a certain, a certain thing that one of my children is doing. And, you know, if I just take a step back and let time play out, it will resolve itself. So, yeah. And I think too, you know, kind of going back to maybe my early parenting and much more of a driven, worried kind of prayer and checking all the prayer boxes that maybe existed as a parent. And I think now trying to lean into the space of, of, of releasing and letting go and being open, I've noticed that my kids are showing up more in my dream life. And I'm paying attention to that in new ways of, okay, what is going on in my mind? What are some of the worries that are maybe being worked out in my nighttime dreaming? What are some maybe things where I'm feeling invitation? There was something striking in that dream or something disturbing in that dream that maybe then invites me to pray in a different way. And so I have found that that's been a really interesting, fascinating aspect of ways in which I'm interacting with my children. And again, not that I'm saying every dream is from the divine or, you know, whatever. I think sometimes we just, you know, have dreams. But I do think that even on a psychological level, sometimes it's stuff that's being worked out in me at night. And there's something about that open space in the in the bedtime hours that, again, I found very compelling to interact with. Yeah, I like what you're saying about that, Christina. And I think you've definitely been an influence in my life and helping me pay attention to my own dreams. Uh, and I, I rarely dream. And whenever I find myself paying, paying attention to a dream that I had the night before, I, I really feel like it has importance and significance. And so I've, you know, recently had dreams about my children. And so I find it very fascinating to pay attention to that dream and you know, what is coming, what is coming forth from the dream? What is, what is God trying to highlight or, you know, or what is in my subconscious, you know, and then what, what is, what is, what is coming, trying to come forth from, from the dream uh, world? And how is that trying to interact with my walking life, my, my 
daily one foot in front of the other life. And so it's been, it's been very helpful for me to pay attention to my dreams. And I, I find that it has a lot of significance and bearing on how I, how I, uh, how I care for my children uh, in the, in the real world. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that can be a huge jumping off point for conversation. And so, you know, there's a few people who I meet with for one-on-one spiritual companioning and often they will bring a dream to me and we will discuss together. What do we think that means? And what comes up with you as you think about this dream? And again, not that we're like changing our whole lives around this, but it really does inform some different things that maybe we wouldn't otherwise notice. I think Chris, even your point about how poetry, it's different language, like different images somehow just enrich our lives and our experience and the way that we're taking in the world around us. And I think that's the same way when we look at different symbols or ideas and dreams of, you know, not a literal interpretation necessarily, but what does that symbolism speak to me in ways that maybe my, when I'm in the thick of parenting, you know, I'm too close to the situation. There's too much emotion and personal stakes involved where sometimes having that a little bit of buffer where I can breathe and take things Mm -hmm. in a different way. I'm hearing it different as a parent and I can receive some of the course correction or the realignment. I think, again, something really that I appreciate about the contemplative is there's always invitation to realign. And when we're coming into those honest places, what is there and how is God in encouraging a realignment to be happening? Well, thanks. What a generative conversation today about parenting. And this is the part of our podcast where we talk about what we're into this week. Um, uh- I have been dying to say that what I am into right now is wasabi peas. <laughs> it's been like a long time since we had them. And then we randomly saw them at the store and we were like, yes, let's get them. And then we introduced them to all of our children who were like, ah. <laughs> so, um, so yes, wasabi peas are my favorite right now. Well, I have been into WandaVision, uh, Marvel television uh, series on Disney Plus. Uh, it has been so fun watching this series with my my two oldest children, and it's really opening up a lot in them with theories and conspiracies. <laughs> it's just fun to watch it play out as they watch a new a new episode. They're like, "Oh, what's going to happen next?" And uh, I just really have enjoyed watching this television sh- series with my with my kids and my family. So to state the obvious, Chris and I are married. And so a lot of times we are into the same things because we are under the same roof. And that is what I was going to be into this week as well. Because if you are a Roberts, you are definitely into WandaVision lately. And I think we're maybe a little bit late to the game. We had some friends that were talking all about this show and thought, okay, we'll give it a try. And yes, it has definitely been very interesting conversations. Our our youngest goes to bed and then we've been watching it. Our older two had some days off of school. And so we have been engaging in that. And it's been a fun family activity for all. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next week, same time, same place. Until then, make it a great week.